Greetings, beloved. I'm Dr. Mark Sharona, and this is On the Living Edge, and I'm so honored that you've chosen to join me in this time. As always, at the very beginning, I want to say to our EDGE partners, thank you so much for your faithfulness, your support, and your prayers. Your difference is the difference that makes the difference for us to take the gospel all around the world to see souls saved, hearts changed, lives transformed, and broken bodies made whole. Thank you. I really am persuaded that hope for the future is what God is speaking right now prophetically to the body of Christ. In a day of uncertainty and turbulence, if ever we needed hope, we are never to take the helmet of hope off. It is the helmet of our salvation. And Paul wants us to know how to renew our minds by hope. And I want to add value to your life in this brand new series, A Hope for the Future. And I want you to open your heart and open your mind and let's open the scriptures once again to Jeremiah 29, 11 and explore what it means to develop a radical hope, even in a day of turbulence and uncertainty, for a future that God has assured us belongs to us. I want to continue to talk to us about a hope for the future. The touchstone verse is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And then in verse 13, he says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. One of the things that I've repeated again and again that I want to reinforce is that the way to understand the future from God's perspective is to learn how to recognize the patterns that God moves in. Pattern recognition is important. All you have to do is look at Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Let's go there for a moment. I want to just re it's great poetry and we, we we ought never get tired of listening to the word of the Lord. He says a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again, blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. And when we look at that from a natural perspective, we see patterns that God created in creation, in nature, that cause life to continue. And even secular songwriters tell us there's a circle of life. Elton John in the great Disney movie Lion King wrote Circle of Life. From the day we arrived on the planet and blinking looked into the sun. There's more to see than can ever be seen. There's more to do than can ever be done. There's far too much to take in here. More to find than can ever be found. But the sun riding high in the sapphire sky keeps blazing strong on the endless round, the circle of life. That's Elton John's version of what I just read you from the ancient words of Solomon the Wise. That, that, that if I'm going to understand the future, I have to understand that the future was the past at one time. That there's nothing new under the sun. And God does repeat himself. So if I'm going to understand the future, I've got to connect the dots by recognizing the patterns of where God's been so that I can know where he is and know where he's going. The, the great book that we all 
think is totally about the future, which is about the past, present, and future, is the last book of the Bible called the book of Revelation. And the key to the book of Revelation, one of the keys to understanding the book of Revelation, is that John is told, write the things which you have seen, that you shall see, and the things that you see. He said, write the things which were, which are, and which are to come. And, and what he's talking about is not linear, it's cyclical. Our problem when it comes to the book of Revelation is that most, most people that want to approach it don't approach it with a first century Palestinian Jewish apocalyptic mindset. They approach it with a current events mindset and they forget that a text out of context is a pretext. So they're looking at it from a linear perspective instead of a cyclical perspective. That which was, that which is, that which is to come. Circle. Pattern recognition. You remember as a kid all the connect the dots pictures that you did sure so so you've got to connect the dots but here here's the thing god says i know the plans that i have for you the good news is you don't have to know the plans in detail god knows them well we can spend a lot of time trying to figure out the plans and not recognize how God embeds in us hints as it relates to the plans. Sometimes we want the whole big picture. I've already told you the story of how George Washington Carver said, God showed me the secrets of the universe. And God said to Carver, he said, son, your mind could not contain. I'd fry your mind is what God is saying. You know, you, you, ask me to show you the secrets of a peanut and I'll show you the universe in a peanut, which led to 27 inventions and the whole change in technology and, and much of what we, 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 we take for granted uh, over a century later is because George Washington Carver found more than peanut butter in peanuts. And he talked to flowers. He discovered that if you talk to flowers, they grow. In heaven, everything is alive with intelligence, even the plants. And, and, um, and, and so, for Carver, the issue was God wanted to give him a little bit of a hint and then let him run with it. And so, God says... Here's the deal. Here's how this happens. Here's how you get a hope for the future. S and you shall seek me, and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found. I will let you find me. I'll let you find me. In other words, what, what, what is really being said there in Jeremiah 29, 13, and, you, and if you will seek me, and search for me with all your heart. He's talking about the power of intention. He's talking about intentionality. Now, intentionality is very important, and intention is very important. It comes from the Latin word intentus, which means to stretch. And what we need to understand is that it's a stretch to hear from God. Because God's going to get you out of your comfort zone, and if you're going to have a hope for the future, a hope for the future implies that what you have right now is not what you want. Okay. You wouldn't hope for something you already have. You don't hope for what you see, you hope for what you don't see. Which means that in order to see what you don't see, you've got to stretch for it. You've got you to gotta be intentional. You've got to want something beyond where you are. How many of you want something beyond where you are right now? Okay. That wanting is the kind of wanting that Jesus says to the man at the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, do you want, do, are, are you willing to stretch? How do you say to a man who's paralyzed, are you willing to stretch? Well, he says, here's the deal. I'm here just to invite you to stretch. So, rise, take up your pallet and walk. You've got to stretch to do that because the zone he's in is not where he wants to be, but he feels like he has no way to get to where he wants to go. And Jesus said, oh, it's real easy. Just intend to get there. Stretch. How are you breathing? Just intention will stretch you. 
It'll get you out of the familiar comfort zone where it doesn't require you to do anything different than what you're doing already. Intention gets you out of the normal substate of mere existence and puts you into a fundamental state of an anointing that breaks yokes that you're not even aware are holding you back right now. And it, it, it brings you into a whole new place of what results do I want to create? Now, now you need you need to understand. In First Corinthians, let's look. Let's go to First Corinthians. First Corinthians. We've looked at this before, but I, but I think it's really really important. If we're going to have a hope for the future, I think we need to think the way the apostles thought and the way Jesus thought. Look at First Corinthians chapter three. Verse 21, so then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. All things belong to you. Just say, all things belong to me. Say it again. Wouldn't it be great if the Bible was true? All things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. That's the future, right? Things to come is the future. Who does the future belong to? All things belong to you. Present past, future, life, death, the world, fivefold ministry, everything in between, Baskin Robbins, it all belongs to Rocky Road. That belongs to me. The rest of it belongs to you. That that belongs to me. It belongs to you. Say 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 it all belongs to me. So, beloved, if the future belongs to you, who told you to give it away? If God is saying, I know the plans that I have for you, why do you stay in a default position of a Doris Day theology? Those of you that don't know who Doris Day is, she's a singer from a former era when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. She used to sing with other dinosaurs like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. And I know that for millennials, they don't even know who these people be. There arose a generation that didn't know Joseph, and there arose a generation that didn't know the great hundred standards of, 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 of the Golden Songbook of America. And Doris Day was one of the singers of those standards. But she had a lousy theology in one of her songs called Que Sera Sera, whatever will be, will be. Okay? Who told you to believe whatever will be, will be? It's not Bible. It's a default position of fatalism. Fatalism doesn't require faith. It simply requires um, fate. I don't believe in fate. I believe in faith. And, and, and my Savior says, when I do come back, I'm going to be looking for faith. But, but you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So here's the power of intention. God lets you find him, watch this, as it relates to you not giving up your future. Just say these words, I still have a future. Say it together. Say it again. I refuse to give it up. God knows the plans He has for me. I may not know, but He knows. But if I seek him with intention, he will let me find him. And when I find him, 
I'll find the plans. I, I, I think we, we've, got to, we've got to come back to square one and understand that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God, every single time, wants to answer your prayers. God is a communicating God. His Son is called the Word. He communicates. Logos, dialogos. God's a dialoguing God. He's a communicator. And He wants to reward those that diligently seek Him. Now here's the thing. God just won't let you, let you find Him. He'll let you find everybody that's connected to what He's got planned for you. See, when you're in, when you're in a, a, a state that Mihai Csikszentmihalyi from the professor from University of Chicago calls peak performance called flow. You enter into this dimension where stuff just shows up. They've proven it scientifically that our body, our brain is built for flow. And even though the early positive psychologists thought it was a dumb name to call it flow because it sounds fluid, science is actually saying that what happens is that there is this flow movement even in the neuro circuits of our brain and flow is the perfect name for what happens when stuff just timelessly, when you are absorbed in something that, that is something you totally love and is tied to who you are, you lose all sense of time, you lose all sense of effort, and with effortless ease, you find yourself doing something and you also find yourself connecting with meaningful others that just, you're, they, God lets you find Him and find them. And our frustration is when we're not there. We never look for confirmations when we're in flow because everything's a confirmation. We only look for confirmations when we're out of sync. And I'm going to suggest to you that more often than not when we're out of sync it's because we have by default given up the fact that the future belongs to us. We've somewhere shifted into a que sera, sera passive approach to the future and given up on it's not going to change it's just it's just going to be the way it is which is not the way the patterns work everything that exists except for God has a lifespan everything that exists except for God has a lifespan even organizations have a lifespan which is why there are thousands of articles and hundreds of books on reinventing organizations. Why? Because every organization goes through birth, growth, and decline, and if they're going to move into the next phase, they have to reinvent themselves, so there's another birth, another season of growth, and they have to anticipate the season of decline so that there can be another birth. Every living thing and every man-made thing has a lifespan. And that lifespan includes birth, growth, and decline. But if you understand that what's happened before will happen again, you can learn to recognize those patterns, connect the dots, and anticipate the future before it arrives, and make decisions so that you posture yourself for a future that you prefer, not one you are terrified by. Because the choices you make determine the future you walk into. Your choices determine your outcomes. And every choice you make in the present determines what you experience in your future. You're breathing. And so, societies rise and fall. Empires rise and fall. Long wave economic and business cycles are identified and analyzed because they rise and fall. And so 
here's what you and I need to understand because the world seems to grow more competitive with every passing day. The world seems to grow more dangerous to our eyes because we don't think we've ever been here before. But I promise you in the days of the nights, K-N-I-T-H, and not the days of the nights, N-I-G. In the days when there were barbarians and they would pl pillage villages and slaughter men, women, and children, I promise you they thought, oh my God, it's the end of the world. They were brutal. I mean, you go back to the 13th century and you look at what, what the kind of behaviors and terror isn't new. Terror is a device of the enemy. The powers of darkness haven't changed. And so the world seems to grow more dangerous with every passing generation. But it's just because every generation doesn't have the advantage of having existed in a former generation to realize this is what we thought, which is why these are the good old days. Carly Simon was right. She's another dinosaur for some of you that don't know who Carly Simon was. She was around when Ty Tyrannosaurus Rex was... Um, Anyway, the world seems less hospitable. Security seems to be less and less available. And because it seems to be that way, dis-ease is increasing and anxiety is rising. None of which helps when it comes to having a hope for the future. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So God wants to fill us with joy and peace in believing. Believing for what? For a future. Beloved, the Apostle Paul tells us that the helmet of salvation is the helmet of hope. When he tells that to Timothy and then when he says it in Ephesians, they're connected. It's the helmet of hope. You can't renew your mind with hope for the future without a mindset of hope. I want you to become hope-filled in a day of uncertainty. And I invite you to partner with me to share the gospel around the world in a day when we need hope. And sow your best love gift right now, $30 or more. And let me put in your hands this viable, valuable resource prophetically inspired in this season to bring you to a new place of hope for the future. Call that number now. Sow that love gift and let me put this multi-message series in your hands to provide you strategies that will enable you to renew your mind in hope. Call the number now and let me put this in your hand. For those of you that are moved on by God to sow a love gift of $50 or more, not only will you get the Hope for the Future series and CD or DVD, your choice, you'll also get a series, a six-message series called Interpreting the Signs of Your Times. And I promise you it will add value to your understanding of how to read into the symbols and signs of what God's unfolding in your life. And for those of you that will sow a love gift this month of $70 or more, to help take the gospel around the world, you will also get, in addition to those two powerful series, you will get my book, Beyond the Shadow of Doubt, that will bring you into a perfecting of faith through the eyes of Peter's journey until the shadow that was literally his darkness became the shadow that brought healing to others. Call that number now. Sow your best love gift, $30, $50, or $70, and let me say thank you for partnering with me by putting these rich hope-filled resources in your hands today. Call now.